Hi everyone, let's start our last unit on advanced sort and search, and this is really just some kind of other ideas that are not um, maybe as crucial or integral, but are really kind of interesting and I think fun to think about for our last unit of the class. The main things we're going to be talking about are randomization, and there's a family of algorithms um, starting with quick select and then quick sort that we're going to see that use randomization in cool ways that we haven't seen before. And then thinking a little bit about um, non-comparison sorting and kind of breaking the lower bounds um, that we've seen before. So that's what our goals are going to be in this unit. And I'm going to move through kind of quickly. Normally I, we might spend a little bit more time on some of these topics or go in a little bit more depth. Uh, I thought about cutting out some things from these slides, but actually one of my goals is in the whole class is I want you to feel confident about the things you've learned. And I also think it's important in this class for you to know what things are we not getting into total depth on and where there's a lot more that you could explore if you were to continue studying any one of these topics. And I hope that you feel like you have the knowledge that you could use to be able to study any of them further. So in some places, I'm going to try to be very explicit, like, okay, you don't need to know these details. We're going to zoom through this a little bit quickly. Um, I know that could be disorienting sometimes, and so I'm going to try to be clear about that, and, and I'm warning you that it's coming. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do, be looking at is the selection problem. That's what we already talked about in the puzzles today. So just quickly, this is the problem. Um, so finding an element of position K in the sorted list. So it's thinking about finding medians, for example, or more generally what's called order statistics. Um, so like the, you can think of this as percentile. So if you have a bunch of data, what's the 25th percentile? That means like the n over 20, n, n over 4 um, value of k. And so these kind of computations come up and are very important for statistics. But the naive way of doing it just by sorting isn't always the best way. So that's what we want to try to explore. And... We've done these things in the puzzle today, so I'm not going to belabor this too much, but sorting is just an n log n solution. Uh, we didn't talk about this today, but you could imagine running selection sort and then stopping after you've selected the first k things. This ends up being k times n. And so what you notice is that if k is large, then n log n sorting is going to be better using like merge sort, for example. But if k is very small, then, then a cutoff selection sort would be better. But we can actually do better than both of those by using heaps. So if we use a small max heap, then we saw from the second puzzle question today that this ends up being a cost of uh, n log k. So that's already strictly better than either of the previous solutions. It's going to kind of adapt both of them optimally. And then we can even do better if we use a, a single big min heap and with the uh, heapify algorithm. So this is one of the cool powers of the heapify algorithm that you learned about in data structures class is that you can quickly create a heap that contains a bunch of data elements. So this ends up being n for the heapify plus k times log n. And if you think about it, because k is always going to be less than or equal to n, this is actually the best so far. It's, it's better than everything else that we've seen so far. But now the problem is that um, if k is in the middle, these are still all going to be basically n log n time. So if k is n over 2, then they're all, all of these solutions, even with the heaps, are still going to be n log n, the same cost as sorted. So we want to think about if we're looking for like a median of a list, because that's k n equals n over 2 means we're looking for the median, or k equals n over 4 means we're looking for like the 25th percentile. Those are the most important maybe instances of this. Um, selection problem, and those are the solutions where using these, even these cool tricks with heaps, don't help us that much. So what can we do instead? Um, well, let's think about it from an algorithm design standpoint. We can, if we have a new problem, we can try to reduce to a known problem, meaning we can take the tricks that we already have in our bag of tricks, like using heaps or using sorting. That's what we just did. Sometimes that only takes you so far, though. Um, memoization and dynamic programming is another big strategy that we looked at. And we looked at a number of different things that that could mean. Um, but you kind of have to start with the recursive algorithm before you can start talking about that. Um, I guess we could put greedy in here. Uh, but again, greedy is 
really mostly makes sense for like optimization problems, and that's not really what this is. There's really one correct answer, and all the other answers are not correct. Um, so we could think about the divide and conquer approach, and that's what's going to be useful. This also is what came up in the in the puzzle. And so what we're going to do, the idea is that we could easily check or find the position of a given element x. So if I ask you what position is 77 in the sorted order, you can answer that by just counting how many things are less than 77 in this list. But asking the other way around, so this is like the selection problem, is saying how do I find the fifth smallest thing in this list? That's a harder question. That's, we're not quite sure how to answer that other than sorting the whole thing. But going the other way around, we can do. So it's another way of saying that if we think of this almost like how we approach P versus NP problems, of thinking how can we check a proposed solution? And in this case, it, it lets us come up with a faster algorithm. So the, the element that we pick is going to be called the pivot. You can think of this as a guess of what the right answer is. And then we're going to check and see which side it ends up on. Um, so the, the way that we divide these things is what's called this partition algorithm. This is something a little bit more refined than what we talked about in class today. So I'll take a moment to talk about this, partitioning. So this is really taking in an array and a pivot and splitting it up into the smaller things and the bigger things. So it's going to take an unsorted array. Initially, we have, that was a bad looking array line. So initially we have an unsorted array, we have the pivot here, and then we have anything over here. And what this algorithm is going to do is transform it in place so that we'll have the pivot wherever it belongs in the correct position in the array. So the pivot will be in its own proper position. And then everything over here will be less than the pivot, and everything over here will be greater than the pivot. Or I guess the way that we we said here is that everything over here is going to be less than or equal to the pivot. So we end up with the pivot in the right spot. Then everything to the left of it is less than or equal to it. Everything to the right is strictly greater than it. Um, so it's like what we talked about in class today for number four or number five. How can you use a guess to split the array into the things that are smaller or greater than that guess element? So this is just doing this but within the array. And the trick is that you can do it by swapping. Um, so we'll start from the outside. So this is kind of like working from the outside in, swapping things that don't belong. So um, I is starting from the left-hand side. So I is starting at 1, and J is starting from the right-hand side at N minus 1. And what they're going to do is move in from the outside, and whenever you find two things that both don't belong, then you swap them. So whenever you find something in the beginning of the array that should be at the end, and something at the end of the array that should be at the beginning, then you swap them. Otherwise, it's all good. And when those indexes meet, that's where you put the pivot, because that means that you're done. So it's just like, you know, splitting into the smaller and greater elements, but doing it in place with swaps instead of having to make any new lists. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about this loop invariant. Um, I think it should be clear that this is big data of n time, because we have these two indices that are starting at the outside, and they're moving towards the middle. So this is going to be big theta of n time. Um, and I'm going to skip that. So the question is, how do we choose a pivot? And we'll actually spend the rest of the time today pretty much just talking about how to choose the pivot. The first dumb idea is just pick one. Pick, let's say that we pick the first element. So this is what I'm going to call choose pivot one. And so this is kind of a pretty simple algorithm that just returns index zero for the pivot. And let's see how that works. Uh, so now we have a complete algorithm for quick select. We're just going to choose the pivot and put it in index 0, then partition everything around that pivot. Um, if p is equal to k, that means that we found it. We got a lucky guess. Our pivot was actually the k index in the array, so we just return that right away. Otherwise, we only do one of these two recursive calls either a recursive call on the lesser elements or a recursive call on the greater elements. And that depends on um, the position where the pivot ends up. So it really depends on how many things are in that lesser list, um, more or less than k of them. Okay, so we're kind of 
splitting the array into two parts and doing one recursive call on one side or the other. And the question is, how well does the splitting work out? And that's going to affect the runtime of the algorithm. But this is the algorithm we're calling quick select. And of course, we hope that it's going to be faster than the n long n that we saw before. So now what we want to think about, we now we remind ourselves what quick select is, how does it work, um, how can we analyze the running time here? Well, the best case and the worst case, you might have talked about this in class today, the best case is that we find it right away as the first pivot choice. And then the cost there is big theta of n just to partition. So just to run through and count how many things are less than or greater than that pivot, that's uh, even if you guess it right away, it still costs big theta of n to check it. And the worst case is that you always pick an extreme pivot. So always picking uh, a pivot that's the great, greatest or the least thing in terms of what's left. And then if you think about it, what we're going to have is a recurrence like we're going to have to spend n time to do the partition. So we pick a bad pivot, we spend n time to learn that it's a ter terrible pivot, and then what's left is n minus 1 things in the array. This is almost the same as one of the problems on your midterm, and this turns out to be big theta of n squared. If you use um, master method b, that's the way that you could quickly see that. It's also the same, I think, as the recurrence for selection sort. So the best case is n, which is great. We would love to have n running time. The worst case is n squared, though, which is even worse than just sorting the whole thing. So the worst case is real bad. The best case is real good. And the question is, where do we really fall along this range? Because we have this algorithm which can be great, can be terrible, um, and we want to know, do I ever want to use this? By all of the analysis that we've thought about so far in this class, where we're, first, where we're focused really on the worst case, this is just a bad algorithm, right? The worst case of this is worse than the worst case of every single um, initial algorithm that we thought about with sorting and with heaps. So initially, based on just worst case analysis, it seems like we should throw this away. But the point of this unit is kind of where the assumptions or things that we've made before in this class break down. And this is an example of one where it has a bad worst case, but it happens to be a really good algorithm. And the reason is the average case. So the reason is that if, on average, the pivot that I pick is usually going to be pretty good. Um, so here's a recurrence that we can write for the average cost. So let's just think a little bit about what this is doing. This is saying we have to always spend n amount of time for the pivot. And then what is this summation? This is summing over the possible um, pivot locations. So the, the pivot location that we pick, it could be the smallest thing, the index 0, it could be index 1 or index 2. So the pivot locations, there's kind of n choices for those. So we're going to take the average of those by considering, by summing up over all n choices of where the pivot ends up, what's the recursive call cost, and then we divide it by n. So this is now an average over the recursive call, average um, recursive cost over all pivot locations. And this looks ugly. Um, I hope that this is intimidating to you. It's definitely intimidating to me. If you look at our textbook or find things online, you can see a precise analysis of this. But we really just care about the big O, and we can simplify this quite a bit. So we can simplify it into just two kinds of pivots, what I'm going to call a good pivot and a bad pivot. So a good pivot is in the middle half of the array. So if we think of the array as this thing like here, and the pivot can kind of be at any potential index. Well, if we cut it into fourths, then the good pivots end up in the middle, and the bad pivots end up on the outsides. So it'd be like bad out here and bad out here. Right, because what is, what's the worst case thing that happens is that we pick, you know, a, a pivot that happens to be the smallest or largest thing in the array. Um, and so what we're doing is, rather than thinking about each detailed case of what we could pick, we're just thinking, like, what's, what's pretty good, like, in the middle half, and what's pretty bad on the, on the outskirts. And now these are both one-half chance of happening. 
And now we can do this analysis because we have a one half chance of a good pivot, in which case we get at most 3n over 4 for the recursive call. Right, so if I have a good pivot, then that's going to split the array into things less than that and things greater than that. And since this is in the middle of half, the worst good pivot is like right here or right here. And so the worst that could happen with the good pivot is that like I pick one that's right around one fourth and I have to go to the right of it. So that's going to leave me with three fourths of the array. And this is what, so this is with a good pivot. And this is what happens with a bad pivot where I might not make any progress at all. Really, we could put t of n minus 1 here, but it's going to simplify it to just do um, 1 half times t of n. And now how do we solve this? So we have kind of a 1 half probability of this, 1 half probability of that. Well, what you should notice is that t of n shows up on both sides. And so we can just solve for t of n. And what we get is, so we'll subtract 1 half t of n from both sides. So that'll end up as 1 half t of n on the left hand side is less than or equal to n plus 1 half t of 3n over 4. Now I want to solve for t of n so I multiply everything by 2 and so I say t of n is less than or equal to 2n plus t of 3n over 4. And now this is a case that we can use for master method B to analyze it, uh, sorry master method A it's a divide and conquer type recurrence, and we only have one recursive call of size 3n over 4. Um, and this, so this, this simply comes out to be a top-heavy recurrence where it's dominated by this 2n. So the whole thing comes out to be big theta of n, and that's the exciting thing that we wanted to learn. Okay, so just to say this again, this would be the same. Ultimately, this more complicated recurrence would also come out to be big theta of n on average. But we can simplify it into just thinking good pivots or bad pivots. Each is one half chance. And now we have a big theta of n um, analysis here just by solving for t of n. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea of how we can say what's the average case. And what this tells us is that we knew before that the best case is n, the worst case is n squared. And we weren't sure, like, well, what's usually going to happen? It turns out the average case is the same as the best case asymptotically. It's maybe like two times as bad. Um, and that means that this is a pretty, pretty darn good algorithm. It's, uh, it means that most of the choices of a pivot, or most of the time, we're going to be able to make really fast progress. Notice that it's independent of k. Um, so no matter what the value of k is, why is it independent of that? It's because we're always able to, you know, or at least half of the time, we're able to cut down significantly on the size of the array that's left. And so this means that even if we're looking for the median, like the unluckiest value of k, it's still going to be able to find that usually in linear time. And once we have a fast average case analysis, the next thing that we usually want to think about is how can we randomize this? Because what can go wrong here? So the problem, the problem is that we have a worst case that we still can't avoid. Here we're saying that we're going to pick the pivot always from the beginning of the array. So this means that a worst case is actually a sorted array. an array that's already completely sorted like this is always going to choose the first pivot and then that's not going to be able to make much progress then it's going to choose two as the next pivot then three as the next pivot um, so the issue here is that on average meaning if I consider any possible ordering of the array to be equally likely then this is going to be linear time but how do we know that every ordering of the array is equally likely we don't and in fact, many arrays that we deal with in practice are sorted or almost sorted. You know, it's very common to come up with things in, uh, I've read some about things like in file systems in your operating system where it's dealing with files and you add a couple more or something like that and where most of the data is already sorted and then you have a few things that are unsorted scattered throughout. And in that case, this quick select is going to do terrible because it's always picking the first thing as that pivot element. So we can think about some tricks to handle those specific cases, but there's a general strategy where we can say, how can I use randomization to make the average case look like the expected case? So what I'm going to do with randomization is say that in average case, we have to assume that the um, input that we're getting is kind of scrambled up. 
In randomized algorithms, we're going to say we don't make any assumptions about what the input looks like. We're going to add the randomization to make sure it's kind of mixed up. And uh, so that's what this is saying here. For average case, we have to make these, these strong assumptions. And the first one about every permutation being equally likely is actually false. Most arrays that we come back, come across are, are kind of sorted already. So we're going to take that away by using random numbers. So that's what this is saying. By using random numbers, in addition to the given input, this is going to make some things faster. We already saw one example of this um, was the Miller-Rabin algorithm for primality testing. In that algorithm, it was be able to quickly identify whether a number is prime by choosing some random numbers. And that happens to be the fastest way in practice that people know how to check for prime um, primality. And so what we're trying to do is basically say, instead of assuming something about our input, let me just kind of shift that assumption to the way that I choose my random numbers. And the reason why that's better is because we can control this. We don't control the inputs, but we can control how we choose random numbers. And that's kind of the, the basis of the idea of why randomized algorithms can be helpful. And so the randomized pivot choice is pretty simple, is I just return a random pivot instead of always picking the first one. And to incorporate that into quick select, all I have to change, everything else in the algorithm is exactly the same. All this different is how I choose the pivot. Now I'm going to choose the randomized pivot um, instead of the always choosing the zero index. And now if we do that, the expected cost is actually going to have the same analysis as the average case of what happened before. Because you can think again of the good pivot and the bad pivot, they each happen one half probability. But now, this assumption that a good pivot or a bad pivot occurs half the time, we're kind of enforcing this. So before we had to make an assumption that our pivot had a one half chance of being good or bad based on the input coming in randomly. Um, but now we can actually guarantee this because we choose it. And that's a really important uh, point because this, this is why, so random, you can say that for the original version where we always pick the first element of the pivot, there's unlucky inputs to that algorithm. For example, if the array is already sorted, that's an unlucky input that's gonna make the algorithm be terrible. With the randomized version, there's no longer any unlucky inputs. So there are no unlucky inputs. What could be unlucky are the random numbers that we pick. So we can still get unlucky, but it's like playing a controlled um, state-run lottery game where you know what the odds are. You know, you're not necessarily always going to win, but you know what the odds are of winning versus paying, playing some kind of rigged game where you don't know what went into it. And so you could say, like, I was unlucky, but were you really unlucky or did something get rigged? Now we know we're controlling the random choice. So we can still get unlucky, but we know kind of what the odds are. And that's what's important about the randomization. And so in practice, this quick select two of just choosing a random pivot is going to be much, 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 much better than choosing always the first thing in the array. Um, in practice, sometimes people do something in between, which is like picking a few elements in the array and taking like the best looking out of those three possibilities for the pivot. But um, I think this is the simplest and, and provably the best way to do it uh, to, to keep it simple and have a big theta of n expected running time. Okay, so the key here is that we have expected running time versus average. Expected running time is better than average case, which is bad, because expected is like under our control, under the control of the random elements that we pick, as opposed to average case, which is making assumptions about the input. Okay, and the last thing to leave you with is that there's one, there's even a third choice of how to do this. This is something that we don't have time to get into at all in this class, but I just want to tease you with the idea, which is that these people, these five authors, came up with an algorithm to actually do quick select in big theta of n time in the worst case. So we just saw that the randomized quick select does big theta of n expected running time, meaning that basically it's going to be big theta of n running time when you do it, unless you're very unlucky with the random numbers that you picked. 
they figured out a way to how actually take out the randomization from that and have it be always big data then. And without getting into all this detail, I want to show you an example of how it works. Um, this is with Q equals 3. So you take your input split into size Q subarrays. So see like this group of 3 goes into this column. Then you find the median of each subarray. So out of these three elements, the median is 51. And so that's going to correspond to picking this median here. So we pick like the medians of every three. And then you pick the median of those medians. So looking across the red numbers here, what's the middle one is, I guess, 51. Uh, no, no, 20. So 20 would be the median of medians. And so that is what you're actually going to pick as your pivot. So you take, like, you split them, you split all of your numbers into little groups, find the median of each small group, then make those into a list, recursively find the median of those, and that's going to be your pivot that you use to then do quick select. Um, and then there's some complicated analysis that goes into it. Again, I'm like blowing through these things. It should be unsatisfying to you, and if, if, if so, then I hope that you'll look some of these things up. Um, and it turns out that Q does uh, Q equals 3 does not work. This ends up being um, big theta of n log n, worst case. And if you try a big Q, that also doesn't work. This also ends up being like big theta of n log n. And um, what's really cool is that, so at that point, if it were me probably trying this, I don't know if I would ever even have this idea to come up with medians of medians. But if I did then I might, and, and a normal person might try like 2 equals 3, Q equals n over 3, you're trying like the two different extremes, and they both don't work, they both give you something which is the same running time as sorting, you might give up at that point. But these authors did not give up, they tried Q equals 5. It turns out that Q equals 4 also doesn't work, Q equals 6 doesn't work, um, so it's really something special about Q equals 5, um, it works. And it comes out to be big theta of n in the worst case. The, the, the reason why is it's a balance between the median of medians, how big is that array, because that's another recursive call, and how close is that to the actual middle for the worst case of what happens for your recursive call for selection sort. So it ends up being kind of a double recursive algorithm. Like I said, it's complicated. We don't have time to get into it. Um, but the thing I want to leave you with about this is that it's cool in theory. I, I think it's worth taking some time to learn about the median of medians algorithm to understand some more complicated recursive algorithm analysis. We don't have time to do it this semester, but I'm teasing you with this and encouraging you to read more. Um, and it's also useless in practice. I don't know if I want to say completely useless, but let, let's be dramatic and say useless. Um, why is it useless in practice? Because in practice, we can just pick a random pivot and we'll get the same worst case behavior without all this complication. All this complication is just to choose the pivot. Step one is just to do this thing, which I can do is by one, one random choice and is going to almost always work really well. It's doing this whole complicated thing with another layer, layer of recursion just to make the worst case be big theta of n. So you can think of this as like, yeah, it's big theta of n, but it has a much higher constant than the expected runtime of the randomized one. Um, so it's a cool idea and it's, and it's really important to explore like the limits of what randomization can do. But in practice, you should use the randomized quick select. It's the best way that we know how to quickly find like the median or any other, um, cape element out of an array without having to sort the whole thing. And then we'll see how that can actually be used, extended to come up with also a slightly better sorting algorithm next time. Thank you everybody. And, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.